We discuss the strategy and tactics used by the Imperial Navy on today's Star Wars Legends lore episode. Hey guys, this is Zach Hotzlatter. Hello and welcome to another Star Wars lore video. Before we begin, I just want to remind everyone that tonight is Discord game night. If you're a part of the Eckhart Slatter Discord, make sure you're tuning in probably around 9 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to play some classic Star Wars Battlefront 2. For anyone who has not yet joined the Discord, follow the link down in the description. Now, there's no formal sign up for the game. I'll just be opening a few servers on the Steam version and also chatting with everyone on the Discord. But let's get back to talking about giant flying triangles. The main responsibilities of the Imperial Navy were the projection of force and the guarding of Imperial assets. These two obligations took many forms, from hunting down the Rebel Alliance, to escorting and supporting other branches of the military, to protecting shipping lanes and key planets. With a far more militaristic and fascist approach to governing when compared to the Republic, the Empire created a navy which ballooned to a totally unmanageable size. In an efforts deal with the overwhelming logistics of maintaining a strong presence across the galaxy while also dealing with chronic shortages in staffing and resources, the Empire highly regulated its military starships. On an individual level, personnel were heavily specialized and typically kept to themselves, or at least within their own groups. Organizationally, Imperial forces were also divided based on purpose. The Navy was positioned across the galaxy within sector groups. Sector groups were themselves made up of several several sub-fleets, and typically contained thousands of ships, including a few dozen Star Destroyers. In the later years of the Empire, many astrographically proximate sectors were grouped into even larger over-sectors and controlled by Grand Moffs or other very high-ranking military or political leaders. Important assets like Super Star Destroyers were often assigned to over-sectors. Now, as a note, after Endor, some High Admirals or Grand Moffs, like Warlord Zinj, were able to consolidate power within their large regions of space, offering significant resistance to the New Republic. So to recap, we have 20 or so oversectors, with each oversector made up of sector fleets and sector fleets comprised of subfleets. Now these subfleets perform different roles, from bombardment to space superiority to planetary assault. Obviously based on their specific role, subfleets often had to rely on each other. The Rebel Alliance was known to target Imperial Deep Lock fleets and their shipyards, which were responsible for repairing, restocking, and maintaining the other ships within the sector. So in other words, by targeting this one specific subfleet, the whole Imperial Sector fleet is unable to operate. Unsurprisingly, commanding officer rank would decrease as unit size decreased. System forces, for example, fell under the command of Commodores, or High Admirals, but the Commodore was ultimately responsible to the local High Admiral, the Oversector Grand Moff if present, and, of course, the Emperor himself. Fleets could be further broken up into squadrons, commanded by Admirals, and lines, the smallest unit commanded by Captains. Something like a single Star Destroyer could constitute a line, as would several cruisers, or a few dozen smaller ships, and I do find it interesting that the Empire is stretched so thin with their officers that in many cases, individual ships would be commanded by lieutenants, the officer rank below a captain, while captains would be responsible for many ships themselves. Of course, besides for the general organizational definitions within the Imperial Order of Battle, specially designed fleets would have protected hundreds, if not thousands, of unique Imperial assets, from worlds within the core, to research installations, to ships lanes. We also see purpose-built fleets like Death Squadron assembled and assigned mission objectives. This gave the force more mobility, which is a good thing, I believe, but I'll talk about that later. So although Imperial sub-fleets were purportedly specialized, this ceases when we examine the Empire on a ship-based level. The mainline battleship and the backbone of every Imperial fleet, regardless of purpose, was the Imperial Star Destroyer. The Empire constructed tens of thousands of these vessels, and used them as the building block for, as I said, every major fleet they operated. Imperial Star Destroyer groups were supposed to be protected and accompanied by support fleets. However, as we see with the Battle of Endor, that didn't always happen. And it should be noted that for 
the thousands of ships which supposedly supported a single Star Destroyer, many, perhaps even the majority of them, would have been totally unsuitable for combat. Things like transports, medical ships, refueling ships, etc, etc. Less important areas of space would obviously be given less assets, and many sectors or at least systems probably were not within range of a Star Destroyer. Patrol duties then fell to smaller vessels, particularly Victory Star Destroyers. Victories, however, were old and slow, meaning that, although the ships were significantly smaller, they weren't any more effective at rapid response. This was problematic, given that they were often responsible for fighting pirates in small, mobile, rebel cells. Imperial cruisers were almost uniformly complemented by TIE fighter variants, and the majority of them were simple TIE fighters, interceptors, or bombers. As we saw throughout the Galactic Civil War, starfighters, especially when combined with the lumbering Imperial ships that they escorted, were easily countered by the Alliance. However, despite this glaring weakness, improved or experimental ties would never see widespread galaxy-wide use. Which is a real shame. Scrap a few dreadnoughts and instead put those resources into TIE defenders and you can much more effectively respond to rebel fleets. When it came to battle tactics, the Empire's main weakness was actually catching and finding their opponents. So, strategy itself often came down to overwhelming the enemy with unmatchable firepower. Of course, individual commanders would make use of distinct tactics depending on the scenario they were facing, but unlike with the Alliance, it's difficult to pick out trends or common maneuvers other than favoring Star Destroyer broadsides and hard-hitting frontal assaults. Of course, the general principles of space warfare, like protecting your large ships with point defense cannons and screening starfighters, was more or less adhered to. We see this blunt strategy because Imperial military actions were dictated by the Tarkin Doctrine, which promoted order through fear and power. Shows of force were important, from the prominence of Imperial Star Destroyers within the Navy, ships that while frightening were not particularly practical, to the creation of superweapons and the serious oppression of the rights of citizens. The creation of sector navies and their organization into 20 plus over sectors was also seen as a means to create uniformity and order, both important concepts within the Tarkin Doctrine. However, this removed much of the Empire's flexibility, which the rebels exploited by striking at the edge of one sector, engaging the local fleet, then retreating and striking elsewhere. Territorial, power-hungry moths often cared little about greater overall Imperial warfare, and instead cared most about territorial security and prosperity. I think a better Imperial strategy would have been a higher reliance on roving defense fleets, with more assets directed to hunting down the rebels. Let's be honest, the Alliance didn't have the means to wage a campaign through the inner and deep core. You could easily take 25% of the assets there, still protecting against pirates and any roving fleets, while making a handful of battle groups with the sole purpose of hunting the Alliance. I've talked before about how the Empire often talks the talk when it comes to fear and power projection. However, they were overly defensive and didn't walk the walk. When they do, when they engage the Alliance directly with something like Death Squadron, we see that the Empire can be incredibly effective at disrupting Alliance activity and destroying destroying assets. My point is, while I do admit that the Oversector system was smart, it was militarily and certainly politically efficient, it was over relied upon during the Galactic Civil War. With the Navy, you have one main battleship, the Star Destroyer, and some support ships. That right there is not a lot of flexibility. Still, you could work with this. Instead, the Empire chose to double down on this inflexibility, and that's how we get the Alliance winning the Galactic Civil War. But that's just my opinion, and I know here I focused a lot more on strategy and asset placement rather than actual battle tactics, but I think the Empire didn't show the same degree of nuance as the Rebel Alliance, and the things I've talked about, whether it's screening capital ships, moving your large ships into effective positions, can all really be adopted to Imperial military strategy, so it'd be sort of redundant to talk about it again. But if that's something you'd like to see, let me know down in the comments, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like. What do you think of the Empire's military regime? How would you rate it? How would you rate the Navy? And what do you think of the Army? Something I didn't talk about at all in this video. Anyway guys, until next time, this has been Eckhart's Ladder. May the Force be with you.